So on behalf of MassCEC and communities that may be considering running a Heat Smart or a Solarize campaign in the future, I want to thank you both for participating today in this interview. Our goal today is to capture your experiences and the knowledge you gained from running your campaign so that it can be passed on to the other communities in Massachusetts. And then for our viewers today that may be less familiar with Solarize and Heat Smart, these programs seek to increase the adoption of small scale solar electricity and clean heating and cooling technologies in participating communities through grassroots educational campaigns that are driven mainly by local volunteers. And these community led campaigns really help simplify the process of installing clean energy systems by pre vetting an installer and offering transparent pricing for homeowners. So now I'll quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Charlotte Ball, and I'm the Community Clean Energy Fellow at MassCC, helping to develop the Solarize and HeatSmart toolkit. I'm joined today by Andy Winslow and Fritzi Nace, who are the HeatSmart coaches for Arlington and Winchester. So let's get started. Um, and could you both just quickly introduce yourselves and briefly explain what your roles um, in the Arlington and Winchester Heat Smart campaign were? Sure, I could go. I could start. Uh, my name is Andy Winslow. Um, I was the Heat Smart coach for the town of Arlington, um, and I was the the head person for the town. And I or helped organize the the volunteers, and I coordinated with Fritzy. And um, my name is Fritzy, and I work with our town energy conservation coordinator doing outreach and also am a member of a sustainable Winchester um, a volunteer group. And so I uh, was kind of the head coach with Andy from Arlington. Um, and we had a little, kind of a co-coach uh, situation in Winchester with Alan Field. Um, he's very much more uh, in the technical expertise and I am familiar with a lot of the outreach avenues. So we kind of teamed up. Well, thank you. Um... Would you now tell us a little about your communities and um, help set the stage for your how your team ran the campaigns? And this can, can include general demographic, size of your town, location, anything of the sort. I think the first thing that set our campaign apart from previous campaigns was the population difference. Arlington and Winchester combined was something like 65,000 residents. And right there, I think that the, the previous campaigns that had run before were much smaller. Um, um, and uh, a, a large portion of residents heat with fuel oil. So we saw that as an advantage um, because the, of the economic uh, benefits that transitioning to these renewable technologies would have over oil heat. Um, but on the flip side, there there was still a large percentage of natural gas users and we knew that that would be a challenge. So uh, I think other parts of the country, they don't have as much oil as we do up here, um, but we also have a fair amount of natural gas. Uh, Fritz, do you have anything to yeah. add? So I would say um, Arlington is a little bit more dense, um, densely populated town. I think square footed or square miles, whatever it's, about similar to Winchester, mm -hmm. but it has twice the population. So more multifamily and apartment units. Um, Winchester is a, a little bit more of a single and two family house um, town. Uh, we do tend to have a, a higher income, uh, median income here, though certainly we have a, a range. Um, Winchester had also run the Wind Saves program a couple years prior to the Heat Smart, which was promoting um, the Mass Saves home energy audits. And prior to that, we had run the Solarize Mass program. Um, so there was some familiarity with this type of community program. Um, and I think Arlington had also run Solarize Mass. Um, That's right. Yeah. So, um, and I think. Arlington particularly has a very strong um, environmental um, focus in terms of the residents. There are a lot of residents there who are very environmentally minded, I guess would be a good way to say it. Winchester also has its population of that, but I think that's a little bit newer um, in, in terms of just a town uh, mindset, but definitely um, becoming a, a stronger self-image for Winchester. That's great. I mean, hearing the inspiration between the two communities, it sounded like the partnership was really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, were you both uh, involved in those 
solarize campaigns previously to the heat smart one i i was not that was before Me i either really um we had just moved to winchester but i was um also the outreach coordinator for the wind saves program so that was a really good um sort of basis to then know what avenues for outreach um were effective and um i think that helped and I would also say Winchester is very largely focused on the school system. Um, and so we have a lot of families and the schools are really um, kind of an avenue for outreach here. That's great. Yeah. That's a great strategy. Um, so now before we dig a little more into what your strategies were with outreach, um, can you just tell me which technologies your campaigns chose to promote um, and how you decided to choose those technologies? So we decided to promote all four technologies, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, solar hot water, and modern wood heating. And the thinking was we wanted to offer the widest net. We wanted to cast the widest net to capture as many people as possible. Um, we, over the summer prior to running the campaign, we had sent out a, um, we sent out a town survey and got something like 400 responses to see which technologies people were interested in. Um, and there was moderate interest in all of them. Um, we didn't expect many people to go for the modern wood heat, but we wanted, we knew some people would be interested and we wanted to let everyone have an opportunity to um, get in on this opportunity. Winchester was similar. We also sent out a survey through Sustainable Winchester and um, discovered that there was interest in most of the technologies, but thought it would be good educationally anyway, um, just to let people know. When you were setting up your campaign, did you establish any goals um, to help you measure success, like as you progress through the campaign and to evaluate the campaign at the end? I think that was part of the application was you had to um, list a goal and we really weren't sure kind of how to base it. So I think we shot kind of high on um, several of them. But uh, in the end, I think um, we were really pleased with the results, uh, not really having a sense of um, what all the different factors would be ahead of time. How about you, Arlington, Andy? Yeah, I, I, I was not involved in making the goals. That was Ken Pruitt, the energy manager. But as Fritzy said, as part of the application, I believe that there were some goals set um, and we uh, exceeded those goals through as the campaign went along. As Fritzy said, we didn't really know what to base our numbers off of, um, but we were really happy with the results. That's great. So you guys ended up having lots of contracts, it sounds like, and installations really boosted the adoption rates. And Yes, and apparently the, awesome. the interest um, as often happens with anything, builds right towards the end. And we understand that some of the installers chose to continue their heat smart pricing even beyond the end mm -hmm. of the campaign. Now we'll move into a little bit about your strategies that you use. So if you could just quickly explain a few of the most effective strategies you think you your team utilized for marketing and outreach. Well, I would say one of the biggest advantages was that we had both towns and volunteers from both towns. So every event was pretty much offered for both towns and had the support of the volunteers from both towns. So that was just a big advantage. We were highly collaborative, which I'm not sure other campaigns did, but it really felt like Fritzy and I were a team mm -hmm. and we were sharing material. We would print a bunch of stuff and just share them between towns. Um, and that was that was really helpful, especially for a group of us who didn't, you know, are learning about these technologies for the first time. We were, it was good to have a counterpart who was also learning and we could build off of each other and we had strengths and weaknesses that we could balance out. Um, so we, we, our partnership was a key aspect of the Arlington Winchester campaign for sure. Yes, absolutely. and having other people in our volunteer pool, some of whom were much more interested in 
drilling into the technologies and the numbers and others who were more interested in helping with, you know, writing articles, um, being present for some of the in-person things. Um, so we, we shared our opening events where we brought in the installers, meet the installers. So for instance, we were able to publicize on Facebook in both towns um, and on both towns' websites. So you just, again, had the advantage of, of double exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and we held events in both towns and invited people to either or both. Um, and I would say those in-person events um, were really helpful to get things started. Um, but then as time went on, a lot of it was, I would say the open houses where mm -hmm. people who had already installed some of these technologies uh, were very gracious in opening up their homes and inviting people to come see what it looked like, what it felt like, what it sounded like, uh, and answer questions, uh, you know, ask their questions about what, what was your experience? What did you run into? That I think was probably the most valuable thing. Mm -hmm. I think that pushed people over the edge from thinking about it to actually signing. I know there were people who would walk into an open house, would listen to the way it sounded and would say, I'm set. And then they would leave and that was it. They just needed to see it and hear it. Um, I would say that, that we had three major um, marketing activities that we did that, that were really impactful. Um, Fritzy mentioned the kickoff events and the open houses. And the third that where we had a lot of success was putting flyers in the, um, the water and water and sewer, bill. water and sewer bills that go out quarterly. Mm -hmm. Um, they, it was an, uh, an affordable way to market. I think it cost something like $400 to get a, a letter out to every house. Um, and we made the messaging uh, short and succinct. And we had tons of feedback that that's how people heard about the program. So the, the kickoff events, uh, bills, uh, flyers in the, in the water bill, and then the um, open houses to push people over the finish line. And I think the water bill letter, because they were from the town managers or whoever the city official was, made it um, uh, something reliable and substantial and gave people confidence that this was um, not just another marketing. Right. Boy. Yeah. I forgot point. that part. We've, yeah. we've heard a lot of feedback from communities and um, residents from our surveys that it's really valuable to have kind of like that local municipality support and realize that it's not just another business coming in to um, make some sales. So, Yes, many you. people said having a team of local resident volunteers vet the installers was really helpful because that's a whole process that you would have to do as an individual, um, but they felt like, okay, somebody's already done that. I don't have to really go into all that research. Though we did encourage people to, to look into other installers if they wanted to do their own research. So it wasn't like, don't talk to anybody else. Um, right. And so you mentioned that the open houses really helped kind of get people to actually contract and sign up with this installer. But were there any activities that you noticed maybe when you were tabling or handing out flyers um, beyond the water bill insert that really like made people just sign up and learn about the program itself kind of before they decided to even consider installing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had several opportunities for events. Um, both of our towns have what we call town day. So that's a big, you know, just walking the streets. Not necessarily everyone is from the town, but it certainly was an opportunity for people to see Heat Smart, the logo, the banner, and the materials. And we had lots of good conversations in those situations. Um, and then I don't remember if Arlington also used their farmer's market, but Winchester used our farmer's market as another tabling opportunity. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are also good. Sometimes installers would come to those just to be able to talk to people. But I think again, having town volunteers there 
talking about the technologies and not necessarily trying to sell a product mm -hmm. that's helpful. One interesting thing that, that we did was before we had selected, officially selected the installers, we were really antsy to get the program running. I think in large part because of the, the season when our program was starting, it was in April and we wanted people to, to start thinking about, I, I forget completely, but there was some timing thing and we just wanted to get get going. Mm -hmm. So in, we had a, a kickoff event where we invited local adopters to come and they spoke, we, we had a panel of local adopters as opposed to a panel of installers. And that was also in, helpful. I think having that someone who's not an installer tell you about a technology is somewhat comforting. And that's another benefit of having the coach. They have other people to talk to that aren't necessarily trying to sell them a product. That's right. I'd forgotten about that. I think the timing was that um, it was supposed to start in January, but there were delays um, sort of not in our hands that I think it became April until we were really able to pick mm -hmm. our installers. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges um, that you experienced during your campaign? I think the biggest challenge really for anyone who is who's in the, the business of promoting renewable thermal technologies is the cost question. Everyone wants to know how much it's going to cost them, either A, to install and B, to operate. And it's that those are hugely hard questions to answer. Every house is so different um, and operates in a different way and the, the operating costs are vary between homes. So I never felt like we had a, a really good answer for people when they wanted to know about the cost. Um, and everyone wants to know about the cost. So that was definitely a challenge that we had to finagle our way around. Yeah, and I think on top of that, there's somewhat of a predisposition of when you're saving energy, you should be saving money. Like there's sort of this confluence of those ideas and that's not always the case. And so sometimes we had to prepare people sort of psychologically or emotionally that, you know, this is a choice unless you're replacing a really outdated, very expensive to operate heating system. Um, this is an effort towards clean heating and cooling. It's at a long-term investment. So it's not necessarily just um, going to, you know, uh, slash your energy costs. Um, so that I think was a challenge. When you looked at a specific technology, did you have any challenges around promoting one or another of them um, individually? Well, yes. Um, the modern wood heat became a bit controversial. Um, I think just as we were launching the program, there was some uh, publicity around some not so environmentally friendly wood pellet development, say in North Carolina and um, overseas, which really kind of cut into the idea that modern wood heating was environmentally friendly. Um, so that was definitely challenging. And it was also challenging um, the messaging that we had to use when we were talking about all four technologies as opposed to just heat pumps, for example, where heat pumps run on electricity. So an easy message would say, would be to convert your heating to electric or electrify your house. But then with solar hot water and, and wood heating, those don't run on electricity. So that kind of throws out some wording that we would have otherwise used. And we had to be a little more diplomatic in the way we would, would market everything in an equal way. Yeah, that was tricky. Um, Cause everything just became a little bit more wordy, um, mm -hmm. a little more complex. And just to be able to simplify the message was, was challenging. Do you think there were any challenges to running the campaign as a partnership between two communities? And then what were the benefits of running the campaign um, between the two communities? 
I, I didn't feel like we had any challenges as a collaboration. I thought it was mm -mm. very positive and it worked really well. Um, I just think the benefits, I mean, part of it was um, Andy was a great co-coach to work with and um, the town of Arlington was really enthusiastic. And so um, uh, it, I think it kind of helped Winchester get more enthusiastic too. <laughs> <laughs> so not that Winchester wouldn't be on its own. I don't want to diss Winchester. There are a lot of, a lot of enthusiasm, but I think it was just um, a really positive collaboration. Yeah, I can't think of any challenges that arose because of the collaboration. Um, I can only think of benefits. Another benefit was at the end of the campaign, both towns had a bunch of money left over in large part because we were sharing all of our materials because we were really treating it as one campaign. Uh, and I think that allowed us to be really efficient with the use of our money because instead of two people printing a certain amount, we could do one bulk purchase and that kind of cuts the costs or we only needed one banner and then we just shipped it to wherever the event was. Fritzy and I were always going back and forth like dropping materials off. Um, so financially, I think there was a benefit there as well. I'll have to give a nod that I think each time the Heat Smart program has run, it widens the circle of experience. And so this whole group of people who have um, kind of continued the effort since the first Heat Smart um, has been available as a resource. So sometimes we even had questions and we would go back to Heat Smart coaches from some of the other towns. And that was really nice. So now a little brainstorm kind of on your part. If you were running this campaign during COVID-19, so there's much less in-person interaction and the events that you held would probably be virtual. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any strategies that you would implement differently to run your campaign? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious if you could have an open house via Zoom. <laughs> Um, if homeowners could, I don't know, I suppose you could have a video tour and then have a Zoom meeting where people could do question and answer. Um, but I, I think it was such a helpful thing to have those open houses that yeah. I hate to lose that piece. I would, would say that we would have utilized social media more than we did. We, we um, really used it mainly for advertising an open house or an event that we were holding, but there's a lot of opportunities for sharing articles about um, the benefits of, of a renewable thermal or um, photos of units that you find around town um, that we could have done more with, but we didn't necessarily need to because we could go in person. But if we weren't in person, social media and email, I think, would play a much bigger role. Yeah. That's a good point. And you utilized Facebook mainly as your one social media tool. So you would have expanded into other uh, platforms, you believe? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that even an Instagram account could have been possible. With uh, One thing that I had kind of dreamed about doing but never realized was going on a walk through town and just snapping photos of everything I could see. I don't know if there are legal issues around that, but those could all be uploaded if we had done something like that. Like you walk around and you say, oh, there's a heat pump. Oh, there's a uh, solar panel or a hot water thing or, a, you know, you see, you see, when you start looking for them, you start to see them all over the place. And I think a lot of people feel like these technologies are very new and no one has them. But when you look, a, a significant number of people use them and are happy with them. Mm -hmm. So that sort of just snapping photos around town would, would have pushed the point of, oh, people have this in my town. Yes, I think that's true. I think just time-wise, we spent our time in more of the in-person and we didn't have anybody um, or not many people who were just really savvy with the social media on board at the time. So I think had we had someone who was just really designated that way, um, that, that would be a benefit for sure. 
I think that in the COVID season, also making videos, like Fritzi was saying, a video tour or an interview with someone would be really valuable. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how it's been uh, for teams that are doing um, programs right now with installers coming and going and if that's been uh, tricky for people to feel comfortable having installers come, um, not just for installation, but for the walkthrough and evaluation. So that, that would be a little- Yeah. One cool outcome from from the Arlington Winchester campaign was I ran into our solar hot water installer in the in sometime in in April or May like in the thick of coronavirus and he said that the, his site visits had dropped way down but they had signed so many contracts from our program that it was giving them work that they could do in the meantime and since a lot of their work was done on on the roof of uh, people felt comfortable with them being there. So I felt good that we had kind of provided this pathway for, for this particular installer to get through the, the hard time. Do you think your campaign was able to inspire additional climate action and kind of sustainability measures to be implemented and huh? more interest in the environmental? Well, it's interesting because Winchester's Climate Action Advisory Committee was asked by the select board to revise our climate action plan from, I think originally it was from 2010, and we had done most of the climate action plan uh, checklist. So they uh, presented a revised climate action plan in June, and it was largely about clean heating and cooling technologies and residential emissions. So I think we definitely helped push that um, to new awareness. Are you guys in a similar position, Andy, in Arlington? Yeah, totally. Um, soon after the Heat Smart program wrapped up um, and the, the Brookline natural gas prohibition stuff started, Arlington also started um, a similar um, policy and I Ken Pruitt, the Arlington's energy manager, um, who was a part of the Heat Smart program and also one of the head authors of this uh, of this um, natural gas prohibition policy, uh, said that he didn't think that it would have been possible without the expanded knowledge of clean heating that Heat Smart had brought to the community. Yeah, it was definitely a big impact, yeah. paved the way, absolutely. Yeah, and I know many more people are aware of particularly heat pumps. Um, and for example, there are some larger buildings in town, a school building that is hopefully gonna be built and there's very much more serious discussion about some kind of ground source heat pump um, and some of the other buildings in town. I think um, there's just much more awareness that this is uh, a good technology. It's, it's a quality technology and a good alternative. My last question is, do you have any suggestions or tips um, that you would like to share with communities that are looking to run a heat smart campaign on their own? So I just want to clarify that that means that they would not have um, as much funding they wouldn't have funding from Mass CEC the way that you did. I think, yeah, I think that there are a lot of things that communities can do that don't cost anything. Like we were saying that the um, open houses were hugely impactful and that that's totally free. It's, it's you pay with your time. Um, and I think that if Mass CEC could provide um, pamphlets and, and printouts that a, that a town could, you know, maybe a, a sustainability group can put out $50, $50 and print out a bunch of these flyers mm -hmm. that maybe Mass CEC has available. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done. I think also um, one of the things that we discovered in the Arlington Winchester teams, um, we were really wanting to help people learn how to use particularly the heat pumps and that there's just a lot of information online 
but also um, I don't know if this is okay to say here, but the Heat Smart Alliance that has developed as a, just a, an ongoing group is just really gathering lots of really good information. And the Green Energy Consumer Alliance, I think also offers a lot of support. So I don't think any town would really be alone out there. Um, I think you just might have to um, reach in a few different directions um, to, to find support and information. Um, but I think there's a lot available online and in Massachusetts in our um, area. And I'll just clarify for our viewers today, we will be interviewing also some of the Heat Smart Alliance members. Um, so you will stay tuned and be able to find more about the Heat Smart Alliance. And thank you both for joining us today. That was really helpful. I think we gathered some great information to help um, communities in Massachusetts and maybe beyond in other states um, consider running their own program. So thanks. Well, thank you for inviting us. It was really exciting to be part of the program. And I had never known anything about heat pumps. And now I feel like I know a lot about heat pumps. <laughs> um, that was that was a great benefit for me personally.